says something that I would never permit in anesthesia and analgesia. Based upon these 64 patients, this paper states, and I'll read it for, to you, propofol therapy is an efficacious and safe choice for restoring normal sleep in patients with refractory chronic primary insomnia. Efficacious and safe based on 64 patients. If you took this to the Food and Drug Administration and says, you know, this shows safety and efficacy, you, you wouldn't get past the front door. This is absolutely inadequate, inadequate evidence of that. And to make such a bold claim with such poor evidence suggests to me that, that the paper was not well edited. I will point out that this is published in a journal called Cell Biochem Biophys. I don't know this journal. This is the only paper on propofol they have ever published and this is the only paper on insomnia that this journal has ever published. So it suggests to me that the editors of this journal were neither familiar with propofol nor insomnia as this paper went through the peer review process. So I do not find the conclusions of the paper convincing. And in my view, when authors overstate their conclusions to say we have demonstrated safety and efficacy, on a small pilot study, um, that's simply a grandiose claim that sh should not appear in the medical literature. And in fairness to the authors, even they note in the article that uh, future experiments and studies are necessary before conclusions could be, uh, could be drawn. Is that accurate? Right, but that statement's been moved to the back. It's the statement on the front that concerned me. And just to differentiate then, uh, from what the authors of this publication do reveal, to differentiate what they reveal compared to the, uh, the standard of care exhibited by Dr. Murray, uh, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, do the authors of this study indicate that it went through some type of review process or ethical review board before they con conducted the study? Yes. Married. And what type, of, what type of review did it go through according to the authors? The study protocol was reviewed and approved by the Hospital Ethics Committee, and each eligible participant gave his or her written informed consent. And where did the experiment take place? This experiment took place at a sleep disorder center in the Department of Neurology and Anesthesia at Doping Hospital. And did authors note that each patient uh, or each subject of the study uh, fasted as required by uh, sedation of this nature? Prior to treatment, each participant was fasted for eight hours. How about the monitoring of blood pressure? The blood pressure, electrocardiogram, and pulse oxygen saturation of each patient were constantly monitored during treatment. And how about the use of an infusion pump as you previously testified to? <coughs> In the propofol treated group, propofol was infused intravenously for two hours using a micro injection pump. And that is a, an infusion pump? That is an infusion pump. And you used the word experiment. Was this uh, essentially a research paper experiment requiring uh, future work? Yes. It, it, it's certainly a reasonable question to ask. I'm not critical of asking the question, although it's not a very good paper, but it's a reasonable question to ask. But it does not establish that this is a safe therapy by any stretch of the imagination. Additionally, it post-dated uh, Michael's uh, death. Yes. Michael Jackson. Yes. Be asked, please. It post-dated Michael Jackson's death? Yes. And how about polypharmacy, as you've testified to? Was there an indication of polypharmacy in this research, or was it just propofol by itself? 
they were very clear that there was only propofol in the study. Now, how would you contrast what was done in that experiment that post-dated Michael Jackson's death with what took place uh, by Conrad Murray administering propofol to Michael Jackson in his bedroom? The patients in this study were treated with a standard of care. And although I have concerns about whether or not it's a good paper, I have no concerns about the standard of care that was applied to these patients. What is described is entirely appropriate. And the paper, if anything, serves to highlight the many shortcomings in the standard of care that Conrad Murray used when attempting to use propofol to treat insomnia in Michael Jackson. Did this publication in any way set a standard of care, even as we sit here today, uh, did this publication in any way set up an appropriate standard of care as to the use of propofol for a sleep disorder? No. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, you've, you've uh, very clearly described 17 separate, distinct, egregious violations of the standard of care, further noting that four of those were not only egregious but fundamentally unethical and unconscionable. Is that accurate? I'm trusting you on the math here. I haven't kept track, but that sounds right to me. You want to check? I don't have any. I haven't. Well, let's assume I, that's the egregious violations of the standard of care. Uh, the lack of the basic emergency airway equipment? Yes. The lack of the more advanced emergency airway equipment? Yes. Uh, the lack of suction apparatus? Yes. The lack of an infusion pump? Yes. The lack of pulse oximetry? Yes. The lack of and failure to use the blood pressure cuff? Yes. The lack of electrocardiogram? Yes. The lack of capnography? Yes. The uh, failure to uh, maintain a doctor-patient relationship? Yes. The failure to continuously monitor um, the mental status of the patient? Yes. The failure to continuously monitor the breathing of the patient? Yes. The failure to continuously monitor and have available the uh, blood pressure, pulse oximetry, and heart monitors to maintain constant vigilant monitoring? Yes. The failure to call 911 immediately? Yes. The failure to chart and document uh, at the outset of the procedure? Yes. That is both egregious and unconscionable? Yes. The failure to maintain written informed consent, again, both egregious and unconscionable? Yes. The failure to document during, throughout the course of sedation, again, egregious and unconscionable? Yes. And the failure uh, to disclose to both the paramedics in UCLA uh, the use of propofol and the um, facts surrounding what Dr. Murray claimed to be a witnessed arrest. Yes. And when I total those up, I come up with 17 uh, yes. egregious violations, four of which are also unethical and unconscionable. Is that, that accurate? Is, is that accurate? Yes. <laughs> now, you described at the outset of your testimony that your use of the term egregious equates to that individual deviation from the standard of care being expected and or likely to result in a catastrophic outcome, namely injury or death to the patient Michael Jackson, correct? Yes. Would you agree that each one of these 17 individual violations individually uh, were likely and should have been expected to result in injury or death to Michael Jackson? Yes. <clears throat> And in your mind, was that a uh, completely foreseeable risk? Yes. I want you to assume uh, the same facts that you've analyzed from the evidence. Let's assume Conrad Murray gave this polypharmacy of drugs to a dehydrated, exhausted patient who may or may not have fasted. And let's assume Conrad Murray gave 25 milligrams of propofol and walked out of the room, and let's just assume for the sake of hypothetical that Michael Jackson was then either, uh, either ingested lorazepam and or ingested propofol. Would it still be your opinion that Conrad Murray is directly responsible 
for the death of Michael Jackson based on his at least 17 egregious failures in the standard of care and his abandonment of Michael Jackson? Absolutely. And would those risks that a patient could uh, consume propofol and or lorazepam when abandoned, uh, would those risks be, in your opinion, foreseeable uh, requiring the doctor to not abandon such a patient? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Schaefer, you, you spoke about uh, the fundamental importance and the trust inherent in a doctor-patient relationship. And I want to ask you, as, as it relates to the standard of care in this case, and the summary of the violations of the standard of care that you provided us. If you could put this into perspective as to what it is that Conrad Murray did to Michael Jackson and how it fundamentally violated the doctor-patient relationship. I'd be happy to. Um, the doctor-patient relationship, I believe, goes back to the, the dawn of civilization. I was in Egypt uh, a year and a half ago, and on stones dating back thousands of years, you can actually see carved medical instruments that are recognizable today. So this relationship is a hallowed relationship. Doctors are permitted to know the most private details of a person's body. Doctors are permitted to know the most private and personal details of a person's life. Doctors are permitted to give very powerful drugs, drugs that might harm a patient or might kill a patient. Doctors are permitted to use knives and cut into a patient's body to remove a cancer or to repair an organ or to replace a knee. Doctors are allowed to do these things because of a hallowed relationship between the doctor and the patient. And if I may, I'd like to just give three observations of this. Doctors are associated with something called the Hippocratic Oath, dating back to 500 years BC. And to quote from it, in every house where I come, I will enter only for the good of my patients. Because at the core of the doctor-patient relationship is that you put the patient first. That is the cornerstone of this hallowed relationship it is because you put the doc is because you put the patient first that you are entrusted with surgery with dangerous drugs with intimate knowledge of the patient quoting from the declaration of geneva a more modern document the health and life of my patient will be my first consideration that is at the core of the doctor patient relationship and finally, I have to quote Columbia University Medical Center, four words, we put patients first. When Dr. Murray agreed to treat insomnia with propofol, he put Dr. Murray first, not Michael Jackson. When he showed up every night with bottles of propofol and bags of saline, he was not putting Michael Jackson first. He was putting Dr. Murray first. And in the emergency room at UCLA Medical Center, when he misrepresented the type of arrest that it had been and withheld information about the drugs that had been given, he was not putting the patient first. He was putting Conrad Murray first. This is the fundamental violation. The patient comes first.